Hello, welcome to the programme. I'm Samantha Simmons. We start in The Hague and the International Court of Justice there is holding the first hearing today where it will consider whether Israel is committing genocide against Palestinians in Gaza. This is the scene live inside the court right now. While well, South Africa brought the case to the court, Israel has forcefully rejected the accusation, claiming it's acting in self-defence. For well, The Hague, where proceedings are about to get underway, uh, there South Africa will put forward their arguments today. Israel will follow with their case on Friday. Let's go live now to The Hague to speak to our correspondent Anna Holligan. Anna, welcome to you. Just explain who the ICJ are and how the court makes their decisions. I'm outside the ICJ now, um, but we've just spun the camera around to show you what's happening behind the scenes because we have two sets of supporters here, Palestinian on one side and Israeli on the other. Police are trying to keep them separated, but there have been a few heated exchanges. The court is just around the other side. As you can see, uh, lots of journalists outside. The hearing's just getting underway now. Um, so we're going to start this morning with um, two ad hoc judges being sworn in, uh, one from South Africa, one from Israel, as countries have a right to do when they don't have judges sitting on the bench inside uh, the Peace Palace. This is home to the International Court of Justice. Now, to be clear on uh, this court's mandate, this was a court set up uh, after the Second World War and it deals with disputes between states. So we're not looking at any kind of criminal responsibility here. This is purely a court that deals with things like border disputes and also disputes under international treaties. So here we are talking about the Genocide Convention. This court case was brought by South Africa under the Genocide Convention, accusing Israel of failing to meet its obligations. I want to just try to turn the camera around again, if we can. Um, there, it's, it's pretty busy here, but actually the action is happening outside the courts as well as inside. And this is really a reflection of how other countries are seeing this as an opportunity to express their support on both sides, the South African case has a lot of support. Israel too, though, uh, considerable support. And later on today, we will be speaking to some of the relatives of the uh, hostages, the Israeli hostages. They have traveled here to The Hague, family members, as have many Palestinian supporters. And even just in terms of the UK, how this uh, split is manifesting itself, Jeremy Corbyn is here in The Hague to support the Palestinian cause. And we've heard from uh, the British Foreign Secretary, uh, Lord Cameron. He doesn't think this case at the ICJ is helpful. And as you can see and hear, tensions are pretty high here in The Hague. This hearing will last for three hours. This is South Africa's chance to present its case. Tomorrow, Israel will have three hours to present its defence. Uh, Israel has denied any wrongdoing in and last night on Wednesday we heard from Benjamin Netanyahu. He says Israel has no intention of uh, expelling Palestinians from the Strip or permanently occupying the territory. Uh, right now this hearing is dealing with interim measures. So South Africa has asked for urgent an urgent intervention. Uh, they want the judges to do a number of things, including ask Israel to immediately cease its military action in Gaza, to refrain from any uh, statements which could constitute incitement to genocide, uh, allow humanitarian access and fact-finding investigative missions to access the Gaza Strip. We will be following this, bringing you all the action from here in The Hague. OK, Anna, thank you. And we can see all the judges who've just lined up there inside The Hague as they prepare to hear the case being put forward by South Africa over the next few hours. Let's hear now from our diplomatic correspondent, Paul Adams. He explains the arguments presented by both sides and looks at the legal threshold for the crime of genocide. For three months, the world has looked on in horror at the scenes from Gaza, the huge numbers of Palestinian civilians killed or forced to move, the sheer level of destruction. South Africa says this is evidence of genocide. Israel says that's an outrageous accusation. According to a 1948 convention, genocide is a crime committed with the intent to destroy a national, ethnic, racial or religious group in whole or in part.
That, South Africa says, is what Israel is doing in Gaza. Just look at the statistics. Israel has killed more than 23,000 Palestinians. More than 300,000 housing units have been damaged or destroyed. And around 85% of the population has been displaced. There's no place in Gaza that is safe. We've seen the number of people that Israel has killed, but not just killed and wounded, but they've destroyed the infrastructure and made it so that life in Gaza is no longer possible. Then there's the question of Israel's intent. Look at what Israeli politicians have been saying since October the 7th. Israel's president. It's an entire nation out there that's responsible. It's hardline minister for national security. They're all terrorists and they should also be destroyed. And the deputy speaker of parliament. We all have one common goal, erasing the Gaza Strip from the face of the earth. But can any of this be said to be proof of genocide? Remember, this is not just about war crimes. Genocide is notoriously difficult to prove. You have to have evidence of a plan or a pattern of behavior that cannot be explained in any other way. Israel will argue that it was acting in self-defense following the dreadful Hamas attacks of October the 7th, that it had no choice but to act. We're still motivated, Israel would argue, presumably on the basis of its military campaign. So even if they have gone beyond what the law permits them to do in a military campaign, it is still driven by the logic of the military campaign and not by uh, a genocidal logic. It'll take the court years to reach a final verdict. But if it thinks the South African case has some merit, it could issue a temporary remedy known as a provisional measure designed to curb Israel's military campaign. Israel could, of course, ignore the court ruling, but such calls from the UN's top legal body could add to the pressure mounting on Israel to act differently in Gaza. Well, you can get more on this with Paul now. Paul, welcome to you. Take us through the time frame then over the next couple of days and when any likely decision, a short-term decision, could be made. It's a very simple process, Samantha, two hours for each side to present their case. Uh, so it's all going to be over fairly quickly. How long it takes the court to decide on whether to issue provisional measures, that is the uh, that interim uh, step that, uh, that the court could take, uh, is a little unclear. But it could happen quite quickly in stark contrast to its final uh, ruling, which, uh, judging by the record of the court in recent years on other cases, uh, could take several years. But I think the South African uh, intent here uh, is probably uh, all about those provisional measures, all about trying to do something that stops Israel in its tracks uh, as soon as possible, uh, brings about some kind of ceasefire uh, primarily. Uh, so that, I think, is what uh, the South Africans are looking for, rather than, frankly, the rather unlikely a prospect of a final verdict in the coming years that indeed this was genocidal. The ICJ rulings are theoretically legally binding, aren't they? But they aren't enforceable, are they? That's right. And both South Africa and Israel are signatories to that 1949 convention. So uh, in theory, uh, both countries uh, should abide by the court's rulings. But you're right, there is no enforcement mechanism. Uh, and so Israel could choose simply to ignore any uh, any provisional measures that the court decides to uh, to lay down. Uh, and I think that is probably what Israel will do, because it has been clear from the get go here that Israel has a very clear, not a clear necessarily, but a very uh, strong sense uh, of what it is trying to achieve in Gaza, the complete destruction of Hamas as a political and military force. And it is not going to be dissuaded uh, by outside for forces. I think what uh, this the implications of this could be, would be to add to pressure, the pressure that is building all the time on Israel to try and modify its behavior. We've already heard for weeks now, the Americans, Israel's chief uh, international backer, uh, asking, pleading with the Israelis to, to go about things in Gaza differently. So far, there's little sign that the Israelis have heeded uh, those pleas. And so another one coming from you know, the, the international, from the UN's top legal body uh, would add to that sense of pressure. OK, Paul, thank you very much for now.
Well, the 15 judges are now presiding there. Uh, we can see the president of the International Court of Justice. This is Joanne Donoghue. Uh, she is making her opening comments, and we will, of course, keep across what is happening there and update you in the coming hours.